Okay, I think I'll uh, make a start. Welcome to you all. Uh, my name's Andy. Um, I'm going to try and get through quite a bit. I'm going to cover kind of membership renewals, a big section on direct debits. Um, I threw in membership renewals because we have to raise a debt for uh, direct debit processing. And then we're going to go look at what you can do with Outlook and integration into Civi. And then we are going to most probably post an appointment. And then if we've got time, well, we've got to have time. My colleague Paul is going to talk about uh, uh, Drupal Web uh, services as well and what can be done there. So quite a, quite a bit to get through. Um, I think I'll do membership renewals and then ask any questions on membership renewals. Um, then I'll do direct debit and ask for the questions. And then we'll have a round up at the end to try and leave five, ten minutes so you can throw any questions out. Um, one thing that's come across, because I've sit, sat through a couple of sessions already, um, if you're an organisation, you're not alone. Um, your problem has been somebody else's problem. That's what I'm coming across, and there is always an answer. Okay, Just, just remember that if you take that away with you. Um, there's various ways of doing it, but basically um, there is most probably already code there, or an organisation has covered that problem before. And typical uh, organisation like ourselves, we're software developers, um, I've been looking at you know, non-for-profit organisations for 30 years and I always try to find something that's unique and new so I can get my teeth into it, but generally it's been done before. Okay, um, so I'm going to cover membership renewal. I've just brought up a standard contact and I've got a, a couple of memberships, um, a very nice extension just thrown on the front here, picked up just showing um, two current uh, memberships. This is a nice little thing. I don't have to click on the number two to go and see if they're current. If it was red, it would be out of compliance. Um, let me just go into membership and basically what I'm going to do, I'll just display a standard membership record. And as you can see, their end date is the 22nd of October. And I've got some custom data down here that says I'm going to pay by direct debit. Now to collect um, membership by direct debit, we have to create a contribution that is kind of in a status of pending. Please come in. Someone knock on the door then, did they? Yeah. Come in. No, it's, um, it's the oh, I see. Oh, wow. <laughs> <coughs> welcome, welcome. Yeah, so to collect money by direct debit, you need to create a contribution record to say pending um, I'm going to collect you and how much you're going to go and collect. So you've got the ability out of standard CIVI to go to, to the more field and renew it and say it's pending and I'm going to collect it by the payment instrument direct debit. Well, that will be time consuming if you've got 30,000, 50,000 direct debits or even if you've got 300. So what we can do, I'll follow my notes so I don't forget to tell you anything, is we can select memberships that's out of the box so a fine membership I've only got, I'm only going to select a few records I'm going to select a certain membership type I've got uh, some individuals and I'm going to say anybody who's due to renew up to the 31st of October I could then select obviously new current and grace they're all my current statuses obviously I wouldn't be ex selecting expired and things like that yeah so if I press my search hopefully I'll get my three records yep that's all I'm interested in the moment and I can select them all and as this and stand one of our standard extensions is renew members I'll take that option Now you might have thousands, okay? So what we've decided to do is not process them immediately. We want to batch them and process them at our convenience. So if I just submit, now it's recorded that those people are in now in a scheduled batch. So if I just go back to Norman Rose's record, up here you can see I've got a scheduled job. So if you bring up this record, you could see, oh, hold on, we're going to process something for this member, be aware. Yeah, he's in a membership renewal process. Now what we've done is we've, we've actually uh, created a batch record as an activity. Yeah, so I've got an activity against the main uh, Miller Technology organization screen, 
and if I click on activities, what it's done is created me a bulk processing activity. Let me just filter those to the bulks. I will need that. And if I view that record, you can see it's scheduled, it's ready to run. I've got a date and a time and I'm going to process three records. I have got the opportunity, if I want, to change this date and time and let it run at two in the morning. Now, obviously, you've got a cron job running in the background every 15 minutes, five minutes, picking up these jobs and processing them at the time. Yeah, I haven't got mine switched on. I have got a shortcut up here. I'm just going to press that shortcut. It just saves me navigating down. Excuse me. Now, what I need to do is go back to Norman Rose's record. <coughs> we should have created a contribution. And I've got a contribution just being created just now. And it's in progress. I've given it a new status of in progress. Yeah? It's in the state of collecting by direct debit. Um, if I just view that record, I've... Uh, change the uh, source, so it's a membership renewal, and there's my two dates, my start and my end date. And down here I'm saying I haven't, I haven't collected it yet, I haven't actually processed this for banks, and it's to be collected by direct debit. So for my three records, I've gone and created a contribution that's sitting there waiting to be processed. But what, what I have done is I've put them in kind of the positive mode. I've rolled this forward. Because it's direct debit, I'm presumed I'm going to be paid. It's, I don't want to later on when I process direct debit to say now you're all paid. We presume they're paid. Then you get your rejections and then you record those ones that are being rejected. You contra them. Are we okay so far with kind of bulk renewal of membership? So select the members, whatever criteria you want renew the members, goes and creates the contribution. Now, if you were to be paid by invoice, for instance, you wouldn't roll the membership forward. You would wait for the payment to come in. So there's certain rules that are required. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to direct debit. Staying with Norman Rose. Direct debit mandate screen. We need to go and create one for him. So this is going to be active. This is my active direct debit. I'm coming down here, I've got an account number. I should imagine I've done it before. Yeah, and you can see I've taken the number. I get the stand, well, this isn't standard, this is just a plugin. This will validate the sort code and account number. If it fails to meet that validation, it will complain. Yeah, I'm using postcode anywhere. Yeah, it's an extension. Um, it, you can make use of it. We have done it front end for web forms as well. Account holder name, yes, Norman Rose. Um, I'm going to generate a batch reference number. I'm going to use the Civi ID and pad it to six characters. It's very common, a lot of our clients require that, but you can, if you wish, specify your own Mickey Mouse, for instance. Um, start date, yes, it starts today. And I've, I've got some options. When do you want this to be collected? So you can run and select direct debits at certain days of the month. So you can have more than one process if required. I'm just going to default it to the first. And it's a new mandate. I'm going to presume, presume this is paperless. So we start off, anybody heard this code ON? Yeah, which is your first time you need to uh, mandate it electronically. I'm going to go through that process. We're not talking about receiving a mandate and then posting it to the bank. Yeah, still will work for that. Coming down, and I'm going to fill out some other information, my collection method. I'm going to say I want to receive any notification by post. Yeah, generally you discourage that. You really want to send emails. You don't want to start producing hard copies, but I'll go down the awkward route. Um, and I'm going to say frequency of payment is just annual. And on this occasion, I'm going to take and click from 112. I may not know that at this stage. And I want a certain type of letter. So if I open that box up there, when an amount changes, you know, you've got to notify the person that there's an amount change. You can have a, an amount change letter or a closed mandate. And this can grow depending on your templates. Yeah. So I'm going to go for a new mandate and I'm going to save that record. Now, I might have taken that information over the phone. It could have been entered in online. Yeah. So let's just go through the stages of what you can do. I need to follow my notes. 
Yeah, I call this uh, kind of a verify account details. So the first option I've got here, print DD verification letters. So generally, if you've taken something over the phone, you need to communicate back. You need to say, this is what you told me. Yep, there it is. And there's my Norman Rose. And I can click on that. I'll just print that one letter off. Now, generally, you need to send a hard copy. You get that in the post. Yeah, you can do it by email. Um, but banks get funny about that, yeah, especially for the paperless. And this is just a typical example of what a PDF might look like, Dear Norman Rose, giving basic information out. Now, a lot of people combine this with their first time notification. I'm going to take this much money from your account on a regular basis each month. Yeah, um, it really shouldn't be used for that. Um, it's the new mandate should do that for you. But you can see down here annual and I'm expected to take 112. You could, yeah, combine them, save a bit of mailing. Okay, um, the next stage is you need to notify banks that you are holding a mandate. Yeah, electronically, you need to create a CSV file and send that off to them. Or if you've got an arrangement with your bank or even a third party. So I'm just going to mimic that. Now you can see down here, I've got a screen that splits it. So I've got one, this is my new one, so he's an ON. And down here, I've got someone who is closing their bank account and we also need to inform banks of the closed closing of the accounts and if I export that I'll open it up in notepad I've got a standard CSV layout which is one of most of the templates will we'll use uh, sort code account number and that's the important bit this ON I've got I'm a new mandate or an OC I'm closing that mandate I don't wish to be informed about that anymore and that can go. <clears throat> the last part would be sending standard emails or letters telling them how much we're going to take from their account or whether it's closed or you've changed your account details etc. Now this one I have batched. The other two I felt I didn't need to batch uh, because you don't normally have great large numbers, thousands and thousands. But quite often, uh, once a year, when your membership subscriptions go up or you increase your donations or something, you need to tell the people you might be running into thousands of letters. And we know PDF is very hungry in memory, yeah? So um, we've given options, but perhaps we create a CSV file and you can mail merge to Word or something. It gives you options. So you can see down here, by selecting this, I've got 10. And we've got uh, sending three emails out, telling them of a change of amount and a new mandate and I've got seven to be printed down here Ooh, open up close mandates pretty similar thing so one is a hard copy and one is emails encourage emails always encourage emails if you possibly can <coughs> so what I'm going to do here pretty similar to it's a bit sluggish come on Pick up. It's actually frozen on me. Yeah, and I'm going to submit that. Now that's gone into a, a batch mode as well. The cron job's going to run in the background and it's going to pick it up and just process it. Or I can go to the activity, as I said before, and change and run at 2 in the clock in the morning when I've got 30,000 records to go through. You don't want to have any impact on your server. It's having a major impact on my the Wi Fi at the moment. Come on. You can see up here, just telling me of two jobs that have been created. That's against Miller Technology. I'm just waiting for it to refresh. Come on. Excuse me a second. That <coughs> seems strong to me. Yeah, I think it's probably the internet. It's just gone 12, everybody's gone to lunch. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not happy, is it? OK. 
Come on. Okay, we seem to be there. <coughs> um, I'll just quickly show you um, on the mandate. Obviously, when we uh, when we sent a verification letter, and we and we sent, uh, you notice that the my direct debit has changed. So down here, we've gone from new mandate to first time payer because we've created a CSV file and we've notified banks that we are holding a mandate. So it's now switched from ON to 01, which is first time payer. And down here, we are recording the date that we verification letter was sent and we're recording the date that uh, the mandate was sent as well. And it's important to store those dates. Okay, going to Miller Technology, I should have two new batches in there. Can everybody come off the internet? <laughs> Stop using it. Yeah. I've got all this in a PowerPoint presentation that you can have. If this gets any worse, I can switch to it and talk you through on the PowerPoint. Okay? I always like to do it live. Okay. What have I, what have I clicked on? I wanted that. Miller Technology. That's what I want. Okay, going to activities. I've got the filter on. You can see, look, I've got a bulk send emails and a bulk post the letters. Yeah. If I click on Norman's record, you should see in the right hand corner up here, there's the previous membership renewal, which is green. It's been completed. It's been processed. We keep a bit of history there. And there's a red one there sending and posting the letter. So what I'm going to do here now, I will do the bulk process. Cron Jobs picked it up, it's going to process it, it's going to look at the time of the activity, do the job. Eventually. Yep, that's been done. I need to go back to Miller Technology. Let's have a look at the batch job. So we're sending letters out. The emails have gone, they've flown out there already. I'll go to the activities. I lied about the emails. I've not processed them. I didn't want them to go. I've always got a tendency to keep sending emails out to people. I shouldn't. That bulk processing yep. at the top, what does that do? Just a way to kick Cron yeah, I'm sorry, that's a shortcut just to kick off the uh, Cron job. Yeah, I haven't got it switched on. I didn't want to wait 15 minutes each time, so I press it and it's executing it. Just a quick shortcut. So the one I've got here, send in the post letter, and I can view that record. So you're saying, where's my letters? That's what you should be saying, where's my letters? So what I've done is I've created a, just a basic CSV. Come on, wake up. Got a few more minutes, so I'm going to switch over to the PowerPoint. <clears throat> no, it's not having it. Okay. Shane, I like to, I like to uh, Yeah, there was an entry in the details. There's the verification letter. There's creating a CSV file to notify the banks. Um, there's going back saying what's been updated. This is processing the letters. <coughs> then I pop over to that activity. And basically what I've got is see this CSV file has been attached to that activity. Okay. And that activity you open up and has got all the details of what needs to be printed on those letters. And within that, it's a breakdown of this letter, what type it is. So whether it's a new mandate letter or whether it's a new uh, a change of amount or it's a closed activity. So this then could be mail merged if, if required. We do provide the PDF option as well. Um, it's your choice. But generally, you would encourage emails. <coughs> the back submission. Okay, so... What happened, the next stage after that is to tell Bax, take this much money from my account. Yeah. So what you basically do 
is, can everybody see this? It's not too small, yeah? So what we're doing is we're finding the contribution. So you've got a contribution sitting there, it's flagged as direct debit. And we are saying, give me all direct debits, yeah? And there's a flag, sorry, there's a flag down there. I've done that, I shouldn't have done that. That says, has it been exported? So you would say no. You don't want to select ones that have been previously exported. So you're saying no. This will then list out all the contributions that you need to select. Then there's an option here that says create direct debit file. Yeah, I get a screen like this telling me I have two people who are new. I have three, which is on 17, which is regular payers. There's the total amount of money I'm going to take. These have been rejected because they don't have direct debit records. Yeah? Or they have invalid direct debit re records. So you get the opportunity to stop at this point and go and fix those. So I've got these rejections. I'm trying to collect money through direct debit, but I don't have a valid direct debit mandate. So you've got the opportunity of trying to fix that before actually submitting your submission for direct debit. There's then, it creates a batch, which you've seen before. It creates another one. It goes against um, the uh, Miller Technology number one, Civi ID one, the main organization record. And you can see down here, there's the CSV file. Yeah, the CSV file, you click on it, and there's your standard layout t showing you uh, the important part, your, your code, and how much money you're going to take. And at this point, because you've created that CSV file, the contribution itself will be completed. It will go from in progress to completed. Yeah, and the memberships, everything's presumed that everything has been collected. Make sense? Any direct debit questions? Anything burning on that? I'll just catch up with my notes. Now the two things that go against the person's record is two activities. When we produced the direct debit letter, it would have also created an activity against that person's record showing you what was in the CSV file. Yeah? So all the details of that letter and what type of letter is an activity. When you do a back submission, the actual physical line, this line, is also stored as an activity against the person's record saying, I've made this deduction on this date. Yeah? So it keeps track of it. There's no doubt that's what's happened. There's an example, that's what it looks like. So this is the, the direct debit export. There's the sort code, the account number, the contribution ID, the total amount that was deducted from Norman Rose and the batch reference that was used. So you've got a record there. Don't forget, in the batch record against the uh, Miller Technology organization record, you've always got the CSV file there. You can always open that up and have a look. That's never going to disappear. That's always going to stay there as the months or years roll by. When you're looking at your bank statement, you look at a batch total then? You do, yeah. Okay. okay. Any more direct debit questions? Membership renewal? Anything burning? I'm around lunchtime. If anybody wants to grab hold of me and talk about any of those topics, your particular needs, please do. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure I can um, uh, have a good conversation about that. I love talking about membership. Okay, Outlook integration. I'm going to switch back and give it another go. Okay. Do you want to try and jump on the three G connection? I don't know if it's going to... I'm not sure. I just want to... Why? Let me... Let me kill this. Apparently it's a three meg, three G connection. Whatever you want to do, yeah. Hold on, let me just because I'd like I'd like something at this for this. Hold on, let me just reconnect. Hotspot. <coughs> okay, topic has been around for a long time is what we can do with Outlook and Civi. Yeah, there are standard out of the box functionality where you can basically. Uh, drag an email into a box, uh, Civi can scan that box and post it into Civi, creating a contact and creating an activity. That's been there a long time. Yeah, um, People have taken it a stage further, we've taken it a stage further. Let's just try this. Yeah, I've got some emails here, I'm going to show you what type of thing that we can do. Um, 
we've we've done some add-ins. Um, first things first, there is um, we've developed this for 2010 32-bit, 2013 32-bit. We are releasing this week the 2013 64-bit. We've had to make some adjustments because of that, but it is available as an extension. Okay, so we've got some plugins. It looks a lot nicer as well on the 64-bit, uh, 2013. I'm using 10 32-bit here. We've got a standard configuration screen. Um, I'm not going to bore you with that, but we have to fill this in, register. That's okay. Uh, getting an API keys. Uh, there's a manual to guide you through that process. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at a standard email here, and I'm going to find that contact. So I'm going to take this option first. Now, it's going to default to the email. So it's taking the email from that, that, that uh, email that I've received. It's taking the email address, I should say. And basically, if I just press search, it's going to look straight into Civi and try and find a match using that email. It doesn't have to be the primary. It'll search for any email, not just the primary. Now, I can <coughs> just click on there. The one that's highlighted, it will give me full details. Okay, so it helps you identify, yes, it's that person I want to connect, uh, attach this email to. So far, so good with the speed. So let me just have a quick look at that. So I've got a standard email that's come from this person complaining, uh, wanting more information about membership. So I could simply just uh, store, this e store this email against that contact. Yeah, so I'll take that option. I get a message saying I've been successful. That's happened and it's gone against this person. Thanks very much. And it closes it down. Let me just refresh that. You can see up here, I've got an additional column that says that was stored against CV ID 209. So if I basically attempt to do that again, it's going to complain. You've done this. Why are you doing it again? Yeah, you don't have to show that column. I'm just displaying it for, for reasons so you can see that that's what's actually happening. So let's just flip back. It's responding a bit better. Let's go to Norman's record. Yeah, I go to activities. Better take that off. Now he's got the standard inbound email. You can see membership request. Let me view it. So the content of the email, the, the, the standard thing that you that comes generally out of the box, the content of the email goes in the details yeah, of the activity. We've taken it a stage further. We've actually stored the email as one of the attachments. So by physically clicking on that, you can actually open up the original email, Microsoft Outlook. Where have you gone? Maybe just taking its time. Tell what, let's just get rid of that. Let's close that. That's the one opening it. We, we all knew what it looked like. Come on. Yep, there's my email. Okay, so you've got a, the actual copy of the email as well against the activity. Okay, let's go back. We'll take the, the uh, second option. Um, I've got um, a complaint from Norman. Let's have a look at the email. Um, please can you uh, record and represent me in a medical complaint regarding my skin cancer? Quite dramatic. Um, I need to store that against someone's record, Norman's record. But I know also, if I find the contributions, pretty similar to what I showed before, and I can search. I know I've got a case running, or I want to be able to create a case, case being part of a module within Civi. So I want to store this as an email in case. I'll take that option. 
Now you can see I'm exposing that Norman has two cases, one called misdiagnosed, so it's, we, we already knew about this problem, and I can flick between another case called Project X, whatever Project X is. So you can see between these two, and, I, and you can see the current activities that are running within this, this um, uh, case. So if I, if I want to attach that email against one of my current activities, I can. So for instance, there is an activity already sitting there called patient complaint. So I've got an option here to save to that selected activity. If I took an activity though that was completed and I tried to save against it, we've blocked that. We said, no, hold on, that's completed. Why, why are you interfering with that activity? If I try and save it against this complaint, it will allow me to do it <coughs> and tell me that's been now, that's actually happened. So I have an activity sitting there waiting within a case. I've taken that email and I've attached it to that person's record. I'll go later on and show you that uh, because obviously it's running quite slow. I have something pretty similar. So I've got another an email, but it's not from Norman this time. It's from an outside firm of solicitors, for instance. Yeah, and they say they're going to represent this person. Well, I don't want to create a firm of solicitors contact record. I want to attach this against Norman's record. Yeah, so I've got this email. I'm representing Dr. B, and it's from uh, this outfit. And you can see I've got a, um, a document that they've sent as well. That's fine. So I'm going to find the contact. Now it's taking the email as the default here. Well, that person won't exist within Civi. So I can clear this. Now I know it's for rows, so I can now enter other criteria here. I can now search, and that should show me all the surname roses within Civi. There they are. I've got a few here. And there's Norman again, the first record. Now, I don't have, I want to store this against the case. I know there's a case running. One burning question is, it would be quite nice if there was a column here to show you that cases existed. Which? Yeah? yeah. Um, it's, it's in the pipeline. Um, so store email in case. Yet again, we get to see Norman Rose's cases. He's got two. And on this occasion, I want to actually create a new activity within the case. Here, what I'm exposing is all the, all the activities that you can use for that case. Yeah? If I switch, for instance, to Project X here, come on, you can see there's less activities available to me. So we're not exposing all the activities, just the ones that have been uh, set up for that case. So I'll go back to my misdiagnosed case my patient complaint come on yeah and I'll put it in the email I'll just create an email save as new activity take the option not sure if it's taken my click or not I'm just being patient <coughs> and that process should have happened Okay. So hopefully all of these, don't know why that two or nine. So let's go back into Civi. Let's be a little bit patient. <coughs> Come on, wake up. So I'm going to go to Norman Rose's case over here. I'll just, I won't go into the actual detail of it. I'll just drop down the different type of activities I've got down here. Yeah, there's the um, email misdiagnosed. You can see here we've got uh, attachments and they're the physical email. So by clicking on that, you can see it uh, directly. 
and you can see the one I've attached to the complaint, the patient complaint, and you can see I've got the email there. I'll open this one up. Because there you can get to see the full email and any attachments that come through are now available to you by attaching the email. Yeah, so it's more than just putting the content of the email as a detail in the activity. Yeah, and it features are going to grow. Now we've got this kind of stable extension. Uh, the features will grow, like create a case uh, at the front end, which would be quite useful as well. Not sh not convinced about that sometimes creating the case fresh because generally it's done back end to start with. But there, we do have the API and the ability to. To do that. A byproduct of this <coughs> is something we've been requested to do as well. Is I've got um, an Outlook web app here. Let me just sign in, and I've got a calendar open. Um, we've been requested to also um, provide the ability to uh, post to Microsoft Exchange appointments. So um, we, we're going to use a simple meeting, uh, one I've got set up here. And if I just edit that record. So um, I'm communicating with Middleton Gene, but it could be multiple people. Yeah. So what I want to do is post to their outlook yeah, that they are going to attend a meeting. Yeah. So I've got a subject misdiagnosed, the location Abbey Hall. And I've, put, I've repeated it down here in the detail, and I've said I've got a bit of a car parking uh, for you if you want to attend this meeting. And all I need to do to post that to their Outlook is go from scheduled to completed. Yeah? Um, we did introduce another one that actually said booked. Yeah, but complete is good enough. So I'm going to go completed. And I'm going to save that. So what it's going to do is it's going to take the um, date and time uh, from the activity. And I'm not sure what date. I picked the 23rd of October. I should have pointed that out already. So the meeting has been saved. If I just edit the record again, I should have pointed it out, shouldn't I, to you before posting. So it's going to post on the 23rd of October at 4.23. A bit precise. Um, and it, the duration of... of it's going to default to 60 minutes. If nothing's specified there, it's going to presume it's an hour's meeting. So if I go to my web app, you can see down here on the 23rd, we've now got an entry here, okay, into this person's email outlook. And if I open that up, you can see here, I've got misdiagnosed case number 53. I've got a start and an end time, and it's defaulted to one hour. Okay, and I've got my details, posted down here. Get the idea? So if I go back and so they perhaps phone the office or they, they request a change. Uh, excuse me. I need to go and I go out. I didn't want that. Sorry, I was already there. If I go back here and I go, actually, it's not the 23rd it's the 22nd and it's at 10 o'clock and it's for two hours and I save it hopefully it'll remove and reschedule for me yep that's told me it's happened Come on. Let me just refresh that. Maybe it's. I think it's doing it slowly. <laughs> yeah, you actually saw it in slow motion. I've not seen it at that speed. That's great. <laughs> So you can see now it's gone from the 23rd. It's quite impressive, isn't it? I quite like that. And you can see it's changed to 10 o'clock here. 
last time, last one, then I'll hand over to Paul. Um, I'll go to the meeting, edit the record. Nobody can make it. The whole thing is cancelled. You save it. At least you've got a record in your case that you try to arrange a meeting, even though it's now been flanked as cancelled, it'll remove it from your outlook altogether. I'm not going to bore you with that. Just trust me, it does. Okay? <laughs> well, perhaps we'll watch it in slow motion again. Oh, it's gone already. Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah? That all looks pretty good. There's just one thing I noticed. It's a sort of, as an example, you're using a medical thing. You might want to make the appointment private, so you're going to put it into people's hands and that option. Yeah, I, there was sort of, one of the tasks we actually did was um, we had to put it into someone's calendar um, and they couldn't adjust it themselves. Yeah, we had to do a dummy one over over. I don't actually know how they technically did it, but it was available to us. But what you're talking about should be doable as well, making that private. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. When you change the CV tip status to completed, yeah. that's what adds it to the calendar. Yeah, <coughs> it could have been another status that we could have yeah. created, but like booked. Or because something. quite often meetings are scheduled, so it sounds to me like you know, you've had that meeting. Uh, yeah, good point. It's just the status terminology. Um, oh. It doesn't have to, we just use the standard out of box schedule completed. It could have been different statuses. Um, and we would adapt to that, that need. It, it may be useful because I've got a few slides on some of the background of that, of how we got there and why it's relatively easy yeah. to, to advance and change things and do different things. Uh, I know this is not necessarily for developers, but it's showing you what can be done uh, and really giving the information to your developers so they can actually do some of these things and just show you what the possibilities are. Uh, and that's what I was going to cover uh, on a few slides. So I'll hand over to Paul. So, so it's really talking about some of the background uh, to the, uh, the right one. Uh, to why we uh, developed this. Uh, it was from a customer requirement, but there was uh, potentially lots of issues. We're, we're not really Microsoft experts. Uh, going from the out, Outlook to Civi, well, we know the Civi API, so we just we, we have got a, an internal expert who you know, actually uh, does know all the uh, the Microsoft way of developing. We're PHP experts mainly on the the, the Civi side. But that's a, uh, another team that looks after that for us. Uh, but from our point of view, we need to find an easy, quick way to integrate uh, with ex the Exchange services because uh, that was the, the task was given. So what we're finding is uh, that actually a lot of small, medium-sized business, uh, large organisations, uh, Microsoft Exchange is a key part of their business. We're also finding Office 365 is being uh, used by a lot of uh, not-for-profit organisations. Now, a uh, quick show of hands, how many people here don't use any of the Microsoft products for, for emailing? Very small number. Uh, I, I, I would have would have expected a few more being an open source uh, solution, but 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 ultimately that's what we're finding. Every time we're approaching people, that they are using Outlook. So these two products, uh, the Outlook integration, are becoming uh, very important, really. And so we're getting more and more requests to to find ways of integrating them. Uh, so that's why we uh, came up with uh, doing these. But the two very different systems uh, and different skills, different expertise required for the integration of both of those. But Microsoft had developed uh, this system for us to integrate Exchange Web Services. Uh, they've got a whole, uh, so EWS is the, the acronym for that. So there's a whole library of SOAP services uh, that we can integrate with. Uh, it starts in 2007, Exchange 2007. Uh, at the moment, uh, well, Exchange 2013, I think, is the current but this system doesn't quite work with 13 yet. We're, we're just working on that. Uh, but basically, it can consume any information from your Exchange server and manipulate any information. So the questions you're asking about, well, what about what well, we want scheduled to be scheduled? No problem. You want it to be put, put in there all the time. Anything you want to do, we, we can easily, easily do. Uh, so there's lots of operations. Within, a vast amount of information. I've included a link there because I assume these slides will be available for uh, 
people after the conference. Uh, all the information you need, and there's literally thousands of pages. But that causes other problems. Now we've got all this information, uh, cost of delivery. Now the developers, uh, the people who, who you'll be probably working with, uh, they're, not, they're not Microsoft experts. Uh, the customer's not really going to want to pay. You're not going to want to pay the developers to de learn a new system, to develop a, a system for you. And the developer's not really going to want to do it out of the goodness of his, his heart. Uh, there's lots of information there. But there's a kind gentleman called James who has actually created a load of PHP uh, APIs. Uh, and again, that's uh, the guy there which actually all we need to do is uh, plug into those, download and plug into those APIs so we can get them from GitHub. Uh, and he's also provided a wiki with all the information we need uh, to actually connect up. Uh, and from, won't go into the, uh, the coding level, but basically oh, there's the, the point about it. it's not supported for uh, 2013, but that's saying that we're currently looking at seeing if we can find ways of uh, tweaking the, the software to do that. It isn't a module at the moment because these are specific projects for specific customers uh, for their requests. But we're trying to find a way of how can we standardize this so we can have things like uh, configurable for the activity types, for the statuses, so you can choose which activities you need to write to the calendar and when. Uh, and also we've got this issue of permissioning as well. Because we're delving into an API and we're potentially looking at large organizations with lots of uh, contacts in there, how do we store the usernames? But th there is solutions out there with an impersonation API as part of the Microsoft products. Oh, sorry, so, so I'll just go back there. So is there, is there any uh, questions on that? So that was a quick overview, but basically there is tools uh, that are relatively simple with just a few commands. Create a, an instance of, I want to connect up to the, the service, uh, which is basically the URL, a username and password. Uh, you build a request, which is, well, what is the uh, subject, who's it going to, etc., time, date, etc., and that, that's all that, that's needed, and you can get that information from the CV activity very easily. So we actually uh, developed that uh, suite very quickly uh, uh, for the customer. Now, like all these things, the big thing is trying to understand the customer's requirement and tailor it to, to meet their needs. So, so that this actually is what the customer gets. This was just a, a quick demo that actually the developer set up just for the, the purpose of today. So is there any, any questions on that before we move on to the, uh, the final subject in uh, ship, uh, on time for that? So any, any questions on Exchange Server integration? Uh, what, what I would say, if you've got any ideas of the types of things you want, then please get in contact with us. As I said, it, it is a, uh, an internal project at the moment that we're trying to develop to find a solution that we can then uh, give out to the, uh, uh, the civic community. Web services. Now, we, we all know about web services. Civi has got a, an excellent API where we can delve in and call information from uh, Civi and put onto other websites. But that's just one way. Uh, and so we're trying to find ways of how we can integrate Civi with lots of other systems out there. So a typical installation, you've either got a single server with your database and your website on. Uh, it may be the database is on a different server, but that's a typical installation. More complicated installation, you may have a back-end Civi uh, administration side and a front-end website just to, to split the load out. But we're finding more and more that we're meeting customers who haven't got uh, any of the supported CMSs. So how do they get to use Civi? How can we uh, give them the benefits of Civi without them having to redesign all their website, uh, move it into a supported system, etc.? cetera? Uh, and so that's the challenges that we've been facing, uh, I think, over recent years. So typically, we're finding we've got to integrate with .NET Microsoft uh, websites, yeah. Java application servers or other non-CMSs. We've got customers out there, they've got their own CMS uh, that's, that's developed. So not everyone in the world uses Drupal Joomla uh, or WordPress. Uh, so that means the market is limited from the Civi point of view. But we, we've got a solution. Uh, we've got some options. As I said, we know about the Civi API, so we can call all that information we need from Civi. We can rebuild these applications in the other website. Uh, that's, that's a viable solution. Uh, so then you would have uh, the 
primary website, the Civi uh, website, uh, and a database server as a separate server. Uh, but so we've got the API calls, calling all the information out of Civi and displaying it on the main website. But there's some difficulties with that. We don't know the, the, the client system. We don't know their web system. The developers of the website don't know Civi or the APIs or the data structure. Uh, so all of a sudden, well, we're still in a situation where two parties have only got half the information. And again, it's the cost of integrating that means someone's got to do a lot of learning. Uh, so the cost has got to come somewhere. But if we can limit uh, that integration point and only have a few API calls, displaying events, etc., with a hybrid system, then all of a sudden we've got a solution that uh, can work and is affordable for those that haven't actually got a uh, Drupal June or, or WordPress website. So we could have the primary website, the main website that customers visit, uh, that will probably show the upcoming events. That will have links to the member's website uh, for membership sign-up, event sign-up, donations, updating their details, etc. Uh, but this again presents another problem. Uh, these are all the, the issues that we've uh, come across in uh, recent years. So, so well, first of all, so the hybrid system, limited API development. We can just give the developers a few API calls that they need to call out the events, uh, split the events different ways, call out the membership types, things like that. Even call out details for, for the customer uh, if they've got their own login system as well. Uh, so it means we can uh, extend uh, onto the, uh, the other CMS. Right, so, so this creates its own challenges. This other website typically has also got its own login mechanism. So now we've got two sites that we need to, to somehow log in. Uh, and you've probably heard the term sort of single sign-on. Uh, so that in itself is another minefield, another load of uh, technology that we've, we've got to get our heads around. Uh, but Drupal provides a solution for this. It, it's, it's a term that we've come up with, uh, with 3SO, which is simple single sign-on. We don't want to actually uh, have a complicated system. We, we can develop a whole load of integration points uh, and development to actually uh, create this single sign-on. But we want to keep this as simple as possible, because at the end of the day, the customer's got to, got to pay for this, and so it needs to be a viable solution. Just a little bit of background on how Drupal works. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, just a point to make. The process we're going through here for the single sign is all based around Drupal, uh, Drupal services, but there's probably something similar in Joomla and WordPress. We haven't actually uh, investigated that at this stage. Because if we've got a, uh, a member site, then we might as well have this member site in a, in a tool that we're comfortable with and uh, we know it's got the power to deliver what we need, which is, uh, in, in our case, it, it's Drupal. So for Drupal login, it's got a database record that's got the session information, and it creates a cookie on the local client browser. It's as simple as that, so it knows whether the person is logged in. Uh, so from uh, the, the simple uh, single sign-on, we just use cookies, uh, but both domain or both sites need to be in the same domain. So it'll be uh, whatever www.example.com and members.example.com. And we use the, the product uh, or the module, Drupal Services module, uh, downloadable, and I'll, I'll show you how easy that is to set up. So this is for the implementers uh, out there. We don't need any development skills to do this. Uh, we just set this up, give the information to uh, the other website, uh, and off they go. One thing to be aware of, though, we don't yet know necessarily what information or what uh, technology is available for logging in on the other website. So we, we could still be limited, uh, but there is ways around that, uh, which I'll talk about. So Drupal services module, it's a RESTful service, uh, also uh, XML the you know, procedure call as well. But it's also an extendable product, so we can actually create lots and lots of uh, RESTful interfaces, even uh, creating a simple uh, CV API as a RESTful interface, uh, just for the other websites to actually call the information in a simpler way. Uh, I, the time, I won't actually go and have a uh, uh, look at the, the site actually uh, of how I'm setting it up, uh, but we'll just skip over that and we'll, we'll talk about how the process works because we should be about finished now. So the user uh, logs onto the primary site uh, with their 
normal username and password. On that primary site, that takes that username and password and it passes the information with the RESTful service uh, to the uh, Drupal website. If it's successful, it comes back and says it passes a, well, it passes a session key, session ID. So now we've got part of the, the information we need to log in. It creates a session within the Drupal table. So we've got uh, all that part sorted out. So you can turn the session information. Then the website, all they need to do is create a cookie with that session information. Uh, the, the details are passed over uh, as part of the sign-on. Then from there, when they click anything on the main website to say go and uh, register for an event, uh, sign up for membership, they've got all their details already available uh, to them. So now all of a sudden they haven't got to log in to both sites, they've just got to log in to one. Now the ideal solution would be that actually we can log in from either site. Uh, but as I was saying earlier, we don't necessarily know what technology is available uh, or what services the other third party website can give us. Uh, so in this case, uh, for, for this particular client that uh, I'm thinking of, we had to stop the login on the Drupal site uh, by using Drupal rules that just says, well, if you go to this page, just get redirected, different URL for an admin login. But again, if users get there, it just logs them out and just redirects them to their normal login page. So they go through this, this same route so, so we can control how they're being logged in. This does mean, uh, I'll just talk about that. Uh, other options, there is the links between the two sites with a way of securing that with a, a session key as well as OAuth authentication. Uh, but it does mean, oh, that's a, our, our summary. Uh, that's a, uh, with this system, uh, well, with the, the Outlook integration, with this development of the hybrid system, it does mean that Civi is more reachable for people who haven't got Drupal Juno or WordPress. Uh, we are increasingly seeing uh, a need to implement Civi uh, in yeah, not sites where basically they've never even heard of open source, uh, never mind know anything about Drupal Juno or WordPress. So it does mean it brings a cost down for uh, the customer. You don't necessarily need to redo all your website in another system, especially if you've got a, a very complicated site, lots of information uh, there, lots of systems there. Uh, you can sort of find a way, uh, there is a solution out there to find a way of just integrating uh, the systems that you've already got. Any questions on that? That's because we, sorry, we have gone over time, but. So. Do you happen to know the split of um, open source compared to other CMSs amongst not for profits? Not as a general, in our experience, we are probably seeing it's well, it's creeping up uh, every time. We probably, I would say, 30% are now, yeah, uh, non, maybe less, yeah. yeah. So, but but every, every time we come across a, a new, uh, well, a new, a new request from a client, uh, I would say 50% of that, that time they are now coming up. Well, we haven't actually got Drupal Juno or WordPress. Yeah. The, the ideal solution is we try and convince them to move on to one of those because that's going to be the cheapest option for them. Uh, but that's not always possible for a number of reasons. Uh, but uh, again, now we've got a, a solution and the solution is just using the existing technology uh, to also be able to allow them to use it. A lot of clients can't take the big hit of redoing their website in Drupal. So having it as a kind of a sub-site, yeah, and all the interaction on the subsite is with Civi, eventually the subsite can become the main site. Because then all you need to do mm -hmm. is pull down your content and anything else that you may be doing there if you're running a, uh, other types of software, uh, eventually could come down to the subsite, you get rid of the main site and you're up in Drupal, you can, you're up and you're there. It's, it's appealing. Mm. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs> did you have a question? Sorry. Uh, did you think about uh, something else uh, other than Microsoft Exchange Server? Server? That's a good point. Uh, at, at this stage, no. Because it, it, it's, it, it's come from the client's request. Uh, so most people are using Outlook. So it does seem a way of uh, simplifying that. Other solutions that are open source, they're relatively easy. Uh, well, I would say to integrate with because we already know that technology. Uh, but it's most people have to handle that themselves, or the technology already out there to integrate with it. So uh, we've not had that need. At the moment.